Okay, it is now my pleasure to introduce our keynote speaker for today. Um, Kenyatta Barry is an attorney who has uh, spent uh, many years working in uh, developing African-American uh, genealogy. Uh, she knows where all the bodies are buried. She knows where all the records are buried. Uh, she is the host of the PBS program, Genealogy Roadshow, and I'm looking forward to some new episodes of, of that coming up too, cross our fingers. Um, but it, it is my pleasure uh, to introduce from California, Ms. Kenyatta Berry. Thank you, Walt. Can you guys hear me? Perfect. Let me share um, my screen, um, actually. Looks like I have, uh, I cannot share my screen. Is there any way um, for you guys to pull up my presentation and I can run through it? Okay, Yana, can you try it again? Oh, sure, I will. Oh, perfect. Um, it just gives me advanced sharing options, let's see. All right, here we go. Perfect. Thank you. All right. All right. Um, hopefully everyone can see my screen. Um, thank you guys for joining us this morning for me in California and this afternoon. Um, a lot of stuff has been discussed. I've been in the background listening to everything and there will be some repeat information, but hopefully with this session, my focus is really to put you or provide really a roadmap for you, for those that have been doing genealogy for quite some time, and for those who are new to it. Um, I will focus, my family is also Virginia, not Washington County, but I will show some references to them as well. So we'll talk about really beginning your genealogy journey, that 1870 uh, brick wall, of course, and then we will also talk about researching African-Americans during Reconstruction, enslaved ancestral research, DNA, very little about DNA, and then what to do once you start your research and sharing your story. So in beginning your genealogy journey, sort of where do you start, right? You start with yourself and work backwards. And one of the things I want you guys to really take away is when you're doing genealogy research, you start with what you know, right? So Amin kind of talked about what he knew about his family, and then finding the family Bible, right? Another way to fill in those gaps are to interview those older folks, the aunts, the cousins, the grandparents, parents, and uncles in your family, and record audio and video of those relatives. Now, once you start with what you know, you fill in the gaps with the interviews, really the next step is to, as we go through this process, is to really identify the records that will help you fill in those gaps, right? And I'll talk about some resources to do that. And also when you're doing genealogy, it's important to really think about what are you trying to find out? Why are you on this quest to begin your genealogy journey? Do you have a certain ancestor you're interested in, uh, a certain time period? So it's good to focus because genealogy can be overwhelming. And also when you're doing those interviews, make sure you try to get those family Bibles, any photos and things like that as well. So some of the myths and challenges um, with genealogy, especially African-American genealogy, is that my ancestors took the enslaver's last name. That is not necessarily true. For example, with my last name of Barry, I cannot assume that my ancestors were enslaved by a Barry owner. So you can always look for, um, as we talked about with the cohabitation records, they'll have the enslaver's name, last enslaver's name on it, which is great. But with this particular thing, um, the exception to the rule is that sometimes if it's an unusual surname, like Dwelly, Simpkins, um, or Ailes, they might have taken the name of the last enslaver. One of the other myths is that all the records were lost because of slavery. We've seen throughout the day that that's not true, right? And we also know the second one, or the third one, excuse me, is not true, is that they did keep records of enslaved individuals. 
So some of the challenges we have is that enslaved individuals were property and slavery was about economics and it was a big business. So the record set does not only include the enslaver, but includes banks, it includes auctioneers, the slave traders, the merchants, the ports, the shipping companies. Ancestry does have a record set of enslaved individuals that were shipped from the upper south to the lower south um, during uh, the domestic slave trade or the height of domestic slave trade. So the 1870 brick wall, this is something that, I mean, mentioned, and it's something that most African-Americans get to, right? So the census that is available today is from 1790 to 1940. But with the 1870 brick wall, the 1870 was the first federal census to enumerate the 4 million or the formerly enslaved. And so you can trace your family back to 1870. So as I mentioned that, it's the first one. Um, we want, our goal here is really to break down the 1870 brick wall. That is really the goal. And to do that, we use a variety of records. And those records include Freedman's Bureau records, which we'll get into. So this is the 1870 census for my third and fourth grade grandparents. They were in Madison County, Virginia, um, in Locustdale Township. And this is Lewis Carter. Things I want to point out in this 1870 census, Lewis Carter, my fourth great grandfather, is 53, male, and M listed as mulatto. Now, I have no evidence that Lewis Carter is actually mixed race. Um, that information, I have not found that information yet in the 20 years I've been researching, over 20 years. But he's listed as a farm hand. However, in that column where it says 4,700, that's the value of the uh, real property. And then 1150 is a value of the personal property. So when I started doing research, I kind of thought, well, if he had this much property, then maybe he was a free person of color. I really didn't understand sort of how he had this just five years after emancipation. But looking at it, it didn't say farmer, it said a farm hand. But as a new genealogist, I didn't understand in reading the document what that really meant. So when you're looking to do your genealogy or you're doing your genealogy, it's important to analyze the documents, right? So looking at just the nature of this family, Lewis's wife, Martha, is listed as black. Is that because she's darker skin? And then you can see some of the children, Fanny Bell, for example, as listed as M for mulatto as well. So from the 1870 census, you gather a lot of information that will help you kind of decipher, understand sort of your family history. And then we have Emily Sellers. Now, what's funny about this is I did this on microfilm. So I was at the Library of Virginia and I was scrolling through the microfilm, you know, your right hand's hurting. And I couldn't find Emily's father for a number of years. If I had just looked next door, I would have found her. It's Lewis, he's right there. So one of the things we talk about a lot in genealogy are friends, associates, and neighbors. So when you're looking to uncover the African-American story of your family, don't just look within your family, look within the community. Today is really about the African-American community in Washington County. So understand the community and the county that you're in. So labor contracts. Labor contracts are part of the records that are at the Freedmen's Bureau. I found them particularly important for me because of my fourth great grandfather. So with Lewis Carter, these labor contracts are gonna be typically agreements between the formerly enslaved and their last enslaver. We've talked about how important that is to find because once you find the last enslaver, that's where you find information about your family. So some of the information we find in these contracts are the employers, the employees, the date of the contract, the terms, the witnesses, and the duration of these agreements. And so here's a sample of one that I found for my fourth grade grandfather. He is on the last line and it's John W. Taylor, Dr. John W. Taylor, and Lewis Carter. Now, if you recall in the 1870 census, Lewis was spelled L-E, uh, it was spelled with an E instead of, uh, oh, excuse me. And 
now you can see they entered a contract on January 8th, 1866 uh, for one year. It was for one half of the crop. So this explains why Lewis had so much property or the property was valued so much. He was actually an agent for John W. Taylor. And I know this because in the 1870 census, um, the agricultural schedule, he is listed as an agent for John W. Taylor. Also, I want to note one more thing before I move ahead. With these particular contracts, you can see that there's different terms and conditions. You have board and clothing, you have uh, a, a number or a number or amount they're paying them. So these are things that you can find out about what was going on within the community and with your family. We've, we've talked a lot about cohabitation records. Um, and I think there was a question around cohabitation records and where to find them. And I know uh, we mentioned that, or there was a mention that there were none in North Carolina. Uh, FamilySearch.org is an excellent website to go to to talk about cohabitation records. Um, their wiki will give you a list of the cohabitation records and probably a link to where to find them, right? So cohabitation is important because marriages are not legal children are legitimate, they can inherit. And then as we've seen, there's information about the former enslavers that are also found in these records. And then the parents and children are listed as well. So here's one for Culpeper County. So my family is Madison and Culpeper County. And this is for Peter Green and Hannah Mudd. Now, what's interesting is the age difference here. Right, you're getting information around what's their date of cohabitation or how old were they during cohabitation. Um, and then you also get the parent's name. So now I have an extra generation to research that I might not have known. These individuals might have died during while they were enslaved, but now I have that information to add to my family tree. As we talked about, as you guys are building out the family tree for Washington County, some people are missing. These are some records that can help you find them, but we'll find other records as well. So researching African-Americans dur during Reconstruction. You know, Reconstruction for me is one of those areas I feel that um, is not explored enough. And I feel that way because there are books about Reconstruction, but we don't talk enough about it and its impact um, and its legacy. There are various views on Reconstruction. Um, if you're looking for some books, I think in the handout I provided some, but Eric Foner has written a lot and has dedicated a lot of his time to uh, his scholarship to Reconstruction. So the period of Reconstruction varies, we say 1863 to 1877. Um, it depends on where you're researching. You know, I've, I've been in a class all week um, on advanced Southern research and someone mentioned that in Alabama, for example, uh, you know, they ran the Freedmen's Bureau out of Alabama. So you really have to kind of understand uh, the county, the state, and the area you're researching. And so Reconstruction was really the period to try to integrate or attempt to restore the South, basically, to bring it back into the Union. Uh, the biggest thing, one of the biggest things, I think, from Reconstruction were the Reconstruction Amendments. So you have the 13th, which abolished slavery except for um, a, if you committed a crime. Uh, you also had the 14th Amendment, which addressed the citizenship and equal protection, and then the 15th Amendment. And this gave uh, Black men uh, the right to vote. This amendment did not really address women. So these are the Reconstruction Amendments that when we, we I say collectively, uh, you know, as Black folks in America, were free or now free, we're thinking these are things that will help us. Now we can have equal rights. We can be a part of society. So you have the Freedmen's Bureau. One of the things about the Freedmen's Bureau that's extremely important to note is that it was not only records that are related to the formerly enslaved. There are records related to the white folks that were in the South as well. Um, also, the Freedmen's Bureau was part of the War Department, okay? So these are military zones. One, one great site, if you're looking for someone and you want to find the local Freedmen's Bureau in your area, is something called Mapping the Freedmen's Bureau, right? So 
one of the things you will learn as you look at these records is that your ancestor may not have necessarily gone to their local bureau if that bureau was not actually doing its job. A lot of these folks had agents that were in the area, but they also had a lot of resistance. There are a lot of people that were working against kind of, you know, integrating the formerly enslaved into society. But these are a great group of records, and they are available at familysearch.org. They are primarily, most of them are indexed, but there are a lot that are not indexed. Um, so you would need to take your time, get yourself some coffee, tea, water, whatever, and sit down and relax <laughs> and look at it record by record. Um, one of the great things about these records as well are the narratives, the narratives and the reports back to Washington. Washington, the reports about how it was going in the general area, right? So we talked about cohabitation records, so talking about marriage records, contracts, but how is it going in Washington County? How is it going in Culpeper? What is the society, what is it like for the freedmen now in that world? Because everything is changing. So don't just look for the records that relate just to your ancestors, but also look for the narratives that are a part of that story. And I'll talk about telling stories later. So what did the Freedmen's Bureau do? They did a lot of stuff, um, established schools, they had hospitals. The hospital records are excellent. I just love looking through those just randomly for some reason. Um, they issued food and clothing. They offered, operated, excuse me, these refugee camps, sometimes known as contraband camps. Um, you know, these are when the formerly enslaved would follow the Union troops that came through and they would have these different settlements, right? We've talked about the marriages. I've showed you the labor contracts, but they also worked with the U.S. colored troops to get their back pay, their bounty pay. And then they supervised confiscated Southern properties. This is important because these Southern properties could have been where a contraband camp was, a former or former plantation, right? That's why they call it and abandoned lands. So these are the record sets that can include information about your ancestors that are not African-American, but can help create and tell a story. So then we have the Freedmen's Bank, very established on the same day, March 3rd, 1865, but very different, very different record sets. Um, the Freedmen's Bank had 37 branches, um, and then, you know, in, by 1871, they had 57 million in deposits, and a lot of people, mostly uh, U.S. colored troops, actually put money into the Freedmen's Bank. The Freedmen's Bank went down for a lot of reasons. Um, you know, it was a financial panic of 1873. It was this management, um, and it caused the bank to close. At the end, they tried to get Frederick Douglass to come in to kind of, you know, pull the bank together. You can find online, if you're interested, various reports to Congress around the demise of the Freedmen's Bank, what was going on. And with these records, if your ancestor actually put money into the Freedmen's Bank, they may have all the information you ever need. Their parents' names, their siblings' names. Are they alive now? Um, you know, where they were born, birth date, all of that stuff. Or they could just have someone's name. So it just depends on what records survived. So when we're talking about enslaved ancestral research, this is where it gets tricky. It's good to know the, you have to know uh, the last enslaver, right? And I talked about that a little bit. One of the things we need to really think about as we're doing this type of research is domestic slave trade. So we hear about the transatlantic slave trade, but with the removal of the American Indians from the West or removal from, excuse me, the South to the West, there was a growth in kind of the domestic slave trade. So we're talking about Virginia, you're in Virginia, all roads lead to Virginia, but there may be some people who were separated from their families and then they were part of the domestic slave trade. So from between 1820 to 1860, we can see how the population grew in Alabama. I think it's very striking that Mississippi in, you know, that the number of folks increased in Mississippi. And you see 33,000 to 437,000 enslaved individuals in Mississippi. 
and we can see Louisiana as well. So this number, it, some people say a million, some people say 875,000, but these enslaved individuals were uh, transported from the upper south to the lower south. This is where I referenced earlier that collection on ancestry. Um, and I believe it's called the Slave Manifest. Um, we can definitely look that up and get that to you guys. But these records show the individuals that were transported by boat from the Upper South to the Lower South. Also, um, these individuals were transported by coffles, which I think was mentioned earlier in Jim Hagee's presentation. But this gives you an idea, the sheer kind of movement of folks from their home or the home that they've known and from their family in the domestic slave trade. And I like to mention this because I feel like when we're doing genealogy and we're discussing our family history, it's not just about looking at names, dates, and places. It's about understanding our family in the historical context. It's about really feeling and uh, understanding how your family fits into American history. And knowing history helps you do that. So the enslaved community. Um, these are terms, you know, you hear the word plantation or planter. Um, I worked on the 1619 project and part of that project talked about kind of the plantation economy, so to speak, and the way in which management styles were developed from that. And what that really means, if you have someone who is a planter with a large number of enslaved individuals, they had multiple people employed. They had to have overseers, they had accountants, they had books. Uh, you know, where they kept records of how much cotton, tobacco, or whatever was produced that year. They kept records of the births and the deaths of the enslaved. So these are records that you can find, usually at probably some universities I've seen them, um, sometimes at historical societies, but you have to understand the enslaved community in the community in the county you're researching. And the, the enslaver also may have some records as well, right, that survived from their business. But really, what we're trying to do is track and build the family tree of the enslaver. So when you're doing research, it's not just about your family, right? It's not just about my Lewis Carter, my fourth great grandfather. I have to create a tree, a tree excuse me, about John W. Taylor. I need to know a lot about him to understand what was going on with my fourth great grandfather. And as mentioned earlier, remember the status of the child was determined by the status of the mother. So that meant if the mother was free, the child was free. Identifying the last enslaver. As I mentioned, the common name like Barry, Carter, or Smith, we've looked at the Freedmen's Bureau records, the labor contracts, got the marriage records, the cohabitation records we talked about, um, the unusual surnames. I'll show you an example of how I started doing research. I really didn't start with my own family. I started with my ex-boyfriend's family. And his second great-grandfather -grand great had a very unusual surname. And so that's really how I kind of found information on him. But you also want to look for the list of the enslavers in the 1850 and 1860 slave schedules. One of the things I wanna mention about census records that I didn't mention earlier is when you're doing your research, you have to understand that with census records, um, the ages will be off. I mean, I'm sure some of you have encountered this where it's like they're 80 or 70 in one year, 10 years later, they're 85, right? Doesn't make sense. Um, I use a rule of plus or minus two to five years you need to do the same thing when you're looking at these slave schedules because the slave schedule will only give you the enslaver, then the uh, age, race, and sex of the enslaved person. So for you to actually know if that's your person, you have to either know from the cohabitation record that identifies the last enslaver, or you have to kind of narrow it down. And what you wanna do is make sure you create sort of a candidate list if you don't find people in cohabitation records of who might be the last enslaver. You do have to research all of them to eliminate them. One of the things we did on Genealogy Roadshow is people had a lot of questions for us. And sometimes we couldn't find answers in the time that we had. So we really had to kind of narrow our approach and focus. And when you're doing research on your enslaved ancestors, that's what you need to do as well, right? So identify the candidates if you can, if you don't have a cohabitation record or any other record, 
research them and then whatever you, you whatever you identify or find about them use that to eliminate them as the possible last enslaver so with state records um these are very rich in some cases um you know, we're finding a lot more of the mainstream sites. Um, Ancestry, I know, does it in Family Search for sure. We'll have records of uh, or wills online. So wills contain either a lot of information or not a lot, right? Um, if someone dies intestate, that means they died without a will, but they may have had property. Um, typically, when you find a will, perhaps if they had enslaved individuals, they will oftentimes first say they want to get all their debts paid and then second they start to you know list the wife or whomever will get the property um it's it's a toss-up i've seen whether or not they will actually list the enslaved by name and who they're going to right and if you get that you need to write that down and track that information but you also get guardianships for kids minor children um, who were able to inherit property when their father died. You get accounts, you get inventories. Inventories are where you're gonna find the property listed. Um, and I'll show an example later, but when you're doing this research and you see the property listed, sometimes it is uh, difficult, right? Because now when you're looking at an inventory, there is a chair, a table, and then Sarah and her two children with the value attached to it. So that can be really gut-wrenching for you as an individual doing this research. However, one of the things that helps me as I go through this process is what you are doing is you're finding those folks to tell their story, to have that connection to them, to make sure they're not lost to history. So while it may be difficult, it's definitely something um, worth doing. So here's who I started with, George Henry Dwelly. And if you have not heard of this book, um, The History of the American Negro and His Institutions, I highly recommend it. Um, some of the research uh, is a bit off. I mean, from what I can tell, the some dates are probably wrong, but the, it's a really good place to start. Um, they did it for North Carolina, uh, Virginia, I think two volumes for Georgia, South Carolina as well. And this was my first introduction. Um, I was looking for uh, George. My ex-boyfriend's name was George. His middle name was Dwelly. And so I just started looking for him because it seemed simpler than looking for Barry's or Carter's or whatever. And this first line, I just love to read it because this is like so much information in what you always want to find as a genealogist. He was born in Columbia County on January 26, 1833. He knows his birthday. A lot of enslaved individuals did not know their birthday. He identifies his father as a white man named C.J. Cook. His mother was a slave, Mary Thomas. Right there, you have his parents, his birthday. Um, I mean, it went on to tell how he was sold twice as a boy. Um, and what happened after his father died. And so here is a statement of the property belonging to his father, C.J. Cook. And you can see on the list of property, it says two Negroes, Mary and George. This is George and his mother. And so from what I can tell, C.J. Cook did not have any other enslaved individuals, did not own any other enslaved uh, individuals. So it was just Mary, CJ, and George. But the person who is the administrator of the estate is his uncle, Aaron Cook, CJ's brother. So it's kind of emotional thinking about it that your uncle is administering the estate of your father, and yet you and your mother are listed as property. But it is a reality. And this record is a valuable record because now I know a lot more about Mary and George outside of just having that narrative when they interviewed him in the book. 
So now we're going to move into genetic genealogy. I know there's been a lot of controversy around this, um, but you know it's something that everyone does. We saw all the commercials, um, but really quickly, I'll run through mtDNA. That's going to be you know from mother to daughter, uh, y DNA, father to son, and autosomal, which is the most popular. And that's 50% from your mom and 50% from your dad. So most of the time, if you've done DNA and you've done uh, Ancestry or 23andMe, you've probably done autosomal or my heritage. So a lot of times we have questions around what to consider before taking a DNA test. Um, I would say, why are you interested in taking DNA? Uh, with DNA, I really feel like um, if you're trying to solve a particular, uh, I guess, outstanding question, uh, whether it is relationship, I think there was a, earlier there was some discussion around whether or not someone was related to the governor because he looked like him, but they didn't know and DNA may not have proved that. Um, but it's also, are you trying to break through a, D a problem, a research problem? And then are you ready for any surprising results? Because you don't know what you're going to get. Um, you may find a half sibling or a first cousin or someone you don't know about. I mean, even in my own family, I have had DNA surprises. And I think we're doing African-American genealogy. For us, there's just wanting to have this connection, right? Connection to the motherland, connection back. And, and yet, when you do DNA, you may not know your most recent common ancestor, how you're really related to that person. And a lot of times, um, you know, it may be a relation that dates back to an enslaved individual. As it's not fun, but you need to make sure you read the terms and conditions before taking a test. What's going to happen to your DNA, right? Ancestry was bought last year by a private equity firm, and there was kind of an uproar of what would happen to the DNA, you know, now that someone else owns Ancestry. Um, and there's not really, you know, a lot of law uh, yet. Um, around DNA and privacy. And a lot of people are concerned because of what we've seen um, with law enforcement. So if you're trying to discover your ancestor and verify a relationship via DNA, I think you should consider all of these things first before doing it. So autosomal DNA, this is kind of, you can find something like this on ISOG, um, which I think also is in your handout that you'll get. Um, but this really tells you sort of the, the percentage of DNA uh, that you inherit, right? And so when you're looking at your DNA results, you get a second cousin, a first cousin, third cousin, fourth, whatever, you can kind of understand um, how you guys are related or at least be able to figure out and get down to um, your most recent common ancestor, which is what you want to do as you build out your family tree. So DNA can definitely be a way, as I talked about in the beginning, in doing genealogy to help you build that tree. As we all know with genealogy, it's never ending, right? You're always building, growing, and nurturing your family tree in different ways. But what's most important for African-American genealogy and genealogy in general is sharing your story. It is so great to find this information. It's so great to have these family trees. But if you're not doing what we're doing today, as we're sharing the stories of the prominent African-Americans in Washington County and sharing the stories of, you know, some of the folks who found their family members, if you keep it all to yourself, then that's not really, you know, you have to share and tell the story, right? Why do all the research and not tell anyone about it? And one of the things I love about storytelling is we all, can agree, we remember a great story, right? Because it captivates you, engages you, your emotions, your values, your imagination. So when someone tells you a great story, you wanna share it. But I think storytelling is good for positive change. And especially now in the way in which we are living today or the environment we're living today, I should say. Um, storytelling is definitely something that will help us Right? It's something to help us engage with, you, with each other as we're continuing to, or starting to, uh, reconnect in public spaces. So when you tell your story and the story of your ancestors, it gives you a sense of connection. 
and it brings them to the present. And that's one of the things I loved about Genealogy Roadshow. I mean, I just have to tell my favorite episode was Gail Lukasik. And, you know, I remember just being so nervous um, because if you haven't seen the episode, it's uh, season three, I think, two, season two um, with Gail. And, you know, she had been doing research and her mom was from Louisiana and had moved to Ohio, and her mom passed for white, and her mom was very fair-skinned, and I just remember being like, oh my goodness, you know, uh, how am I going to share this with her, because I knew she knew some of her story, but she didn't know the full story, and from that moment in telling her, um, you know, that it wasn't just her grandfather that was Black, it was her grandmother that was mixed race, and that you know, there were all these other folks. I mean, it, with Gail, what's so fantastic, and this is the power of telling a story, is that once that episode aired, her mom's, so her grandfather, uh, her grandparents that got divorced, her grandfather remarried. He had, I believe, four other children. He had one son, and that son was a junior. That son's daughter had a friend who watched that episode. And after that, she said, you have to watch this, you're related. And Gail heard from her aunt before she died and her uncle because she was on Genealogy Roadshow, because she shared that story, because her mother never went back to Louisiana. They never had anyone visit them from Louisiana. So now she has a whole branch of her family that's opened up. And that's why it's so important to tell these stories because it brings your ancestors to life. It provides that historical context. And for those 4 million, for those that died enslaved, you know, we humanize them. They are no longer on a inventory or an appraisement to, with a value attached. They're human being. And you want to think about who do you want to tell your story? And how do you want them to tell your story? Right? That's important. Because I want to tell my story authentically. Authentically, I want to tell my own story before someone else tells the story of Kenyatta. And I want to tell the story of James Philip Sellers and Lewis Carter. And I do that all the time because I want to make sure everyone remembers my family. They were not just farmers in Virginia. They were not just people that were enslaved. They were human beings who were part of American history. And so that's why I think when we're doing this research, it's so important to tell your story. So what does it mean to tell a great story? Start with a message, right? I'm not saying write a novel <laughs> or a book, but you know, who's your audience and what message do you wanna share? Do you wanna tell a story about an ancestor who was in the military? Uh, they may have been the war 1812, an ancestor that might've um, you know, migrated at post-slavery, an ancestor that might've fought in the civil war. So kind of what message do you wanna share? And then mine their experiences. Find the things and telling a great story is something people can connect to. So what events do you want to share? What's most compelling? In telling stories and in doing genealogy and doing African-American genealogy, it's about history. It's about sharing that history. And you also want to find a hero. We all want to have a hero. We always want someone who's overcome something, right? Who, you know, found their way to do great things. So what lessons did your ancestor learn? What events did they witness? And you always want to highlight a struggle. That's really important as well. So I know I've gone through a lot um, today, but I want the things, you, for things for you to remember is that you can get past the 1870 brick wall. Again, this has been talked about many times, cohabitation records, Freedmen's Bureau records as well. Um, records of the enslaved exist in the names of their enslavers. And get to know the county. We're talking about Washington County, but people migrated. You know, my folks are from Madison, Culpeper, Orange County, that area, uh, Charlottesville area. Also, when you're doing research, do not jump to conclusions. A lot of times, especially if you have a common last name, we'll think that's your person and it's not your person, right? Um, look for resources at your local library, your historical societies and archives. 
but also remember to cite your sources. This is the one thing that every genealogist will tell you, and they make that mistake. We saw in the tree, they cited the source of where they got the voter records. They cited the source of where they got co cohabitation records. Citing your source, sources is very important because as you do this for many years down the road, you'll be like, well, where did I find that? Even if that source is great on Helen, whatever that source is, put it in your tree. One of the things I found in my old tree on Ancestry is I cited my sources and my notes. And when I go back to it, I'm like, oh, I forgot about that. But it's a good thing to do. Um, obviously, if you have a tree online, do that. Um, or you can use uh, traditional genealogy software. I use Family Tree Maker as well as Mac Family Tree because I'm a Mac user. Um, but one of the big things to remember is do not attach your tree to another tree without verifying the sources. This is sort of like a thing I got on a soapbox about, but I'm not going to do that right now. But I think it's really important because you get these hints on Ancestry, right? And you see someone who seemed to have documented you know, several generations back. But if you don't know the person, you don't know their research, and you look and there's just a name, a date, but no sources, um, you wanna make sure you verify everything yourself. You wanna go ahead and do your own research. So with that, um, I will open it up for questions. Let me see in the Q&A what we have here. Oh, so Lisa asks, how did I know that uh, Lewis Carter was Emily's father? Great question. Um, so Lisa, I was actually able to find a marriage record for, um, for uh, John Philip Sellers and Emily Carter. And from that, is where I, uh, and it had their parents' names on it. And that's how I found out that that was her father. There was other documents as well. Um, I believe her death certificate also listed. One thing I didn't mention, um, and I mean talked about this earlier when we were talking about vital records, when you look for death certificates, they're only good, or look at them, they're only good as the uh, informant, right? So the person who provided that information. Um, and so with her death certificate, it included her father and her mother's name as well, but also the marriage record helped me verify that. Let's see, I see something from Irvin. Okay, being schooled at an Indian school in Kings Mountain, his mother is Sally Burton. Okay, so the question really relates to if you have some oral history um, and you have a family story. And again, that's what we started with on Genealogy Roadshow. And with the family stories, um, you know, you have to prove or disprove it, right? So if, you, if you've heard a story about someone being schooled at an Indian school in Kings Mountain, North Carolina, then I would look for those records or look for records um, for about that school, right? So uh, I'm not familiar with Kings Mountain, but I would, I would advise you to understand the county, understand those records. Um, and then also, I would try to look up uh, Troy Saddlebrook, you said, who was um, American Indian. Um, and then also, if he was assassinated in Virginia, then I would look for any records related to kind of why was he assassinated, right? Was it something in the newspaper? Was there a crime committed? So when you're doing research to verify these stories, you look for records at every level of that. So that would be the educational records, that would be the new, that would be newspapers, as well as any type of um, prison records that might exist. All right, do we have any other questions? Okay, wow. No questions. It's interesting. Oh. Okay, I do have one. Okay. Okay, so the comment is basically in doing family research, I found that my earlier relatives owned slaves. Often there are names of slaves and records that don't show up on statistical type records using ancestry. So I've been trying to enter named individuals into Ancestry with references. I use the owner's last name in quotes 
if I can find a last name. For those owned by more than one person, I enter multiples. Um, yeah, I mean, when you're looking to do research um, or you're doing research for those, if you know folks that enslaved individuals um, and, and you're trying to find that information on Ancestry, for a while, Ancestry took away the ability for you to actually search um, from, or actually, let me take this back. When you would do a search for an individual for a period of time, um, it wouldn't show if they were enslavers, right? So if they were listed in the 1850-1860 slave schedule, that kind of went away. And then sometime, I believe last year, it came back. So now when you're looking at those records, you do want to try to look for multiple names. Also, I think to Amin's point he made earlier um, about uh, the indexing of records, um, that's something you want to pay attention to because the indexing was done a long time ago. And so people are indexed incorrectly. And so you really want to actually look for um, multiple variations of folks. Sometimes you have to go page by page. It's always, always great, always to look at the original, right? Don't rely on the index itself. Look at the original document um, because then you will be able to see the handwriting and you can also understand how the enumerator kind of, you know, maybe that their R is funny or their O's a different way or their I's a different way. You can understand that from looking at the document. Okay, so uh, Lisa, actually the question is, I mentioned, I, I believe it's called the Slave Manifest. Um, so these are the records that documented the enslaved that were transported from the Upper South to the Lower South. Those records are available on Ancestry.com. Um, and I have not seen them on Family Search. Uh, not all enslaved individuals were sent by ship. I mean, you can find some that have a long list of enslaved. Um, also in those documents, you can find uh, both a first name and a last name as well for the enslaved. Okay, so there's a question around how to find Native American history of the area. Um, depending on where you're searching, one of the big things we always get, we got all the time on Genealogy Roadshow, is that everyone thought they had Native American um, ancestry. I would understand the history of the area first. Um, and then also kind of look for uh, the Native American history, what tribes were there, um, as well as understanding what type of conflicts occurred in the area. Um, was there, you know, were they forcibly removed? Were there, you know, any type of wars there? And then once you understand that information, and you can get that both by going, you can get that from going to Family Search Wiki, which I always tell people to go to because I love it so much. But also, you really need to probably um, buy a, depending on where the area is, probably purchase a book uh, that describes the history of the county and the town as well. All right. There's also a question: How to find the Native American history of the area? Oh, yeah, that's what I was talking about. So yeah, for that, I would definitely say you need to understand the history of the county, right? To find the Native American, um, to find the Native American kind of ancestry, right? And then go to Family Search to help you with that. Understand which record set might be available for that area, that county, uh, related to the Native Americans there. One thing about Native American research, at least in this area, is that not very many Native Americans stayed around you know, after after the the last battles with the whites. Uh, they receded. So you think about hold on just a second. Uh, you think about the uh, people who were wound up in Oklahoma. They were moved there from Georgia. They were not moved there from Washington County, Virginia. So. Mm -hmm. There's, there's going to be a disconnect between information that you would find today yeah. with the tribes and anything that would be in Washington County, simply because Washington County, there are no records about Native Americans unless they stayed around and, for example, married into a family. Mm -hmm. So how do you decide which spelling of a last name to use? Um, I mean... I mean, you just gotta, a lot of times I just do like special characters, like I'll do the first three letters and then like an asterisk or something like that. But there's so many different ways that a last name can be spelled. 
um, you know, for Barry, I mean, it could be B A B E. You could be B R R I E. I mean, it just depends. Um, and also, again, it's the indexing. You have to remember when you're doing this research, you're looking at an index that someone created based on what they thought or they felt the record said, right? It doesn't necessarily mean that that's actually, you know, the correct version of it. But I would just say start with the first three letters and an asterisk um, for the last name. And that's usually how I do my research. Okay. Yes, but I'm funny. What would the slave of Edinburgh's surname could be? Okay. So there's a question related to there's an unusual surname, because I talked about, again, uh, you know, I talked about common and unusual surnames, and that she couldn't find anyone that was a slave owner with this uh, surname. And could that name have just been something that they like or that they made up and used? It could have been. Right. The choice of the surname for those who didn't have one while they were enslaved was something they picked. It could have been their last in slavery. It could have been their, you know, the enslaver at the time they were born, uh, their parents in slavery. It could just been a name that they liked and they picked up. Um, so in those circumstances, it does become more difficult. I would suggest that you would look for records where William was living if they have any Freedmen's Bureau records and labor contracts and look to see if he had a labor contract in 1866, like we saw at Lewis Carter with his uh, last enslaver, uh, John W. Taylor. Let's see. So my great grandmother had a baby with a white man, but is listed as being married to someone else with a mixed child. Hmm. Okay, so the question um, from Lisa is that her I think it's great, 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 fourth great grandmother had a baby with the white man, possibly the owner, but married to someone else, that mixed child. Okay. Um, so a couple of things going on there. One is we have to remember that interracial marriage was not, was generally, I mean, there were some states that allowed it, but generally outlawed um, in the United States until 1967 with Loving versus Virginia. So probably also though she might've had this child with this white man, she married someone else because she could not marry him. Maybe he did not wanna marry her. I would ask you to kind of like research and see, did he have an entire family? Um, oh, and this is in Missouri. Okay, so that's interesting. Um, then I would look at the laws in Missouri of, um, of interracial marriage at that time, but I would also I would also think that maybe it wasn't something um, it wasn't an option. I don't know. I mean, you'd have to. One of the things about do, doing genealogy is you can't always understand why people make certain decisions, right? I talk about storytelling. I talk about what we should do um, in making sure we, uh, you know, kind of tell tell our ancestors' story. But some of those decisions that they made, some of the things that happened, we may never know the answer to. Okay, so then Stephanie typed in that um, Barnetta McGee White has transcribed the known North Carolina cohabitation records in a three volume set. And that is called Somebody Knows My Name, but it only includes the names of the husband and wife. And I think that was just provided to everyone so you can write that down. We have two um, participants raise their hand. Oh, sure. Um, feel free to um, voice your opinions if you want. Or questions. Okay, I see. I see their hands wave. Jim Luton, if you can unmute yourself, we can get you on to ask a question. Are they able to unmute themselves or? They were able to. Okay, so either Lloyd 
or wait. Okay, um, while we're waiting to sort that out, there was a question on how do you suggest getting white DNA relatives to provide family information about possible men who had children with enslaved women? Um, so I would suggest approaching this very carefully, of course, um, because we all get those messages from people that say you're related to them, right? Or you're my cousin or whatever um, on Ancestry. But if I would reach out to the person first and then uh, see if they're doing um, if they're doing the re if they're doing research on that that family member, right? Um, actively researching that family member. Um, and then seeing how open they are to your message. Because what you might find is that some of the relatives may not want to talk about it. They may not even know about it, right? So what you would need to do is message, I would suggest messaging them first saying, I'm doing this research. I think we have a common ancestor, whatever, and see if they come back um, with a nice note and then kind of ease into the conversation that you believe uh, that your uh, ancestor was the child of, you know, their relative. All right, so are any records on finding relatives in Liberia? So records on finding relatives in Liberia. Um, I'm sure there are, I have not done research in Liberia. However, again, I'll send you to my favorite place, the Family Search Wiki, just go there, type in Liberia, and uh, that would be the, the best place to look. And they will give you resources. So the Wiki will give you information about what's available online. And Yada, what about ship manifests when the uh, the recolonization effort mm -hmm. was underway or whatever into Liberia? Would there be ship manifests of the African Americans who were taken to Liberia? Um, yeah, there actually probably could be. I think what I would look for though is probably records related to kind of the societies or the folks that were sponsoring um, that. Um, you know that recolonization. So I would look um, for records related to those societies. I would also maybe there would be some kind of newspaper records as well. And then there's a question around um, Nova Scotia. Uh, so Abington sent Blacks to Nova Scotia. This I did not know. Do, uh, I don't want to mess up your name, your first name. So I'll just say more. Um, you pronounce it Dolores. Oh, Dolores. Okay. Yeah, yeah. I, I don't know um, about that. That's the first time I've heard of that. I would I would defer to anyone else um, from Abington uh, if they had any information. I mean, how did, how did you hear about it? Where'd you find that information? Well, basically in uh, Mr. Hagee's uh, book. Oh, okay. Uh, Mr. Hagee and uh, the Abington Historical uh, Library Archives. And he mm. called it to me. Attention. And I went to Marion, Virginia, and a friend was with me, and she found letters that were was written from um, one of the slaves to uh, her master, Preston. And mm -hmm. so uh, I did research it a little bit, and it looked as though Abedin, Virginia, at that time, they did not want uh, free Blacks or freed Blacks in the area, and they were not allowed to uh, move out into other areas. So actually, they chartered a ship, and they sent many of the relatives up to Nova Scotia. And so many did not stay in Nova Scotia, and they were shipped to Liberia. And oh. so and that's another question there. Now... If they are saying that we come from Africa, you know, which Nigeria in the the uh, eastern western seaboard, uh, it's like how can we find our genealogy that attaches us to uh, our relatives that are in Liberia and that is in Nigeria and all those areas? And I'm not really able to find any. And I, I just come from a conference in, um, where was I, in Utah, in that conference. Mm -hmm. 
And that's, that's my question. Why isn't my DNA attaching itself to relatives that is in Africa? Because my relatives do show up in America, but there is none, and they are showing up in Europe but they are not showing up in the continent of Africa. Yeah, you, know, you know, the the you know like on ancestry and uh yep. 23 mm -hmm. meat, you have the actual names and the pictures, you know, if they put pictures of your relatives, but none is showing up in Africa and I'm not understanding why. Yeah, I mean I'm not a DNA expert by any stretch of the imagination. I mean, I do I know enough to get, to get by to be dangerous, but um I mean, one of the things about DNA you have to think about is when you're taking a DNA test, um, that they're going to compare you to people that are in their database. So if you and I are related, both take an ancestry test and we show up as cousins, right? It's because we both are in the database of ancestry or 23andMe. Um, and I have only known, <coughs> excuse me, one person who actually was able to uh, connect to an ancestor uh, or connect to a relative in Africa. I have not seen that happen um, as much. So I would say for that, I would do more research on like sort of, um, you know, kind of looking at who you are connected to, probably testing in multiple places. You may want to use uh, GEDmatch as well. But in the handout, I also refer to ISOG, which is like the International Society of Genetic Genealogists. They have a very good... Um, website that can help walk you through that a little bit more than I can. I said yes. And uh, speaking to the panel, speaking to Walter, yes, um, there is a book called The Book of Negroes, and there is a movie called The Book of mm -hmm. Negroes. Yeah. Yes. And um, the movie depicts the uh, how the individuals that were sent to Nova Scotia, how they lived and the discrimination that they experienced. But my thing is, um, I'm looking for the DNA relatives. One of the Johnson, Johnston DNA relatives uh, contacted me and she's saying that looks like one of my relatives, uh, Emily Johnston that married Robert Hill uh, had been shipped to Nova Scotia. And so, and um, it would be nice to have those books in our historical society uh, so that we can understand that many of us were shipped up to Canada or that was, yeah, Nova Scotia up there. Yeah, and many of us did branch out to Canada. And, Dolores, and can you send me kind of some library. information on those What's books? What's that? what you say? Can you send me some of the information on those books and we'll see if we can get copies of them here? I sure will, I sure will. But I would love to, some kind of way, contact with um, the African relatives. And many of the English and Irish relatives did show up. And like the question before, asking how can we contact with our white relatives? And uh, it's like, you know, be an open dialogue. I noticed on the historical society, how many uh, uh, members that we have and what records do they have and how can we um, engage in dialogue uh, to understand our connection so we can find our relatives, yeah. And that was one other question It slipped my mind right now. Yeah. Okay, if it comes, I'll... Oh, 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 yes, I wanna show my face. Yeah, I did my DNA. Let me see, can you see my face a little bit? Yeah, I'm on, uh, let me see. Okay, there I am, hi. Um, let me see. Looking at the Native American DNA, and I know there's... Uh, See, that's why I was on mute. There's a, a controversy about us, whether we are just have white ancestry or do we actually have Native American ancestry? Well, looking at some of my DNA relatives that did their DNA, the Indian uh, 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 ancestry is definitely showing up in their um, DNA. Uh, my DNA stated that I have a great-great-grandmother or that was born in the 1700s and she was full-blooded Indian. I will love to some kind of way find history on that. And then another cousin, um, they actually have slanted eyes. I said, oh, that's how you guys look like that. 
her her DNA stems up there to uh, Siberia and Russia in that area and uh, in here in the continent of America. And I contacted her. I said, did you see your DNA? And so in that area, Native American is basically in a lot of our uh, DNA. And we pass those stories down. Uh, they're telling us, your ancestors were Indians. And we hear those stories over and over and over again. So I am not going to repeat what Gates said. Ha! <laughs> You know, oh, you know, and that that uh, that argument that is going on, but in our DNA in that part of Virginia, we definitely have that Native American in our blood. Okay, with that said, that's it. But I will um, find uh, get you the information. All right, Mr. Walter. Thank you. Very All right. Much. All right. Thank you. And Kenyatta, I was so excited to. Be here and hear you this morning. So well, thank, thank you. you. Thank you so much for joining us. Yes, yes. All right. All right. I'll give I you some know. more research to do, Miss Kenyatta. Yes. <laughs> All right. <laughs> thank you. Oh, oh, oh. And another thing. We were talking about um uh uh Frankie Newton. As a matter of fact, uh Frankie Newton, Mr. Walter, his uh great great grandson was on the call this morning, he just left. His mother is still on the call. And as a matter of fact, my great great grandmother is Elizabeth Newton and Tommy Newton. And the way I found them is through the cohabitation record. Yeah. All we'll right. Have, we'll have a segment on him here at about 3 15. Yeah. Okay. All right. So he's our Jerry. relative. I know Jerry is on here too. And uh, Frankie Newton is our relative. All right. And that is a good segue to Jerry Jones. Uh, Kenyatta, right. thank you very much. Uh, obviously, we appreciate it. And she will be back on at about 4.15 for some more discussion about, uh, about research. Um, so we look forward to having her back.